How are you? We want to welcome our Facebook family, our YouTube family, and all those of you on our social media platforms. Great to have you uh, this midweek. We are gathered uh, together um, uh, just to jump right into the Old Testament. We've been going through the Old Testament uh, book by book and chapter by chapter, and we are now in the book of Joshua. Everybody said out loud, we're Joshua. And so I'll ask you to open to Joshua. Say thank you for meeting us here this evening, for sharing yourself with us, your Holy Spirit and your Word. They're here, Lord, to help us, um, to teach us, to remind us, to impress on us your Word, and uh, Lord, so that we can become more like you. So I pray, Father, that as we go through the Scriptures, and we go through um, what Israel went through, Lord, that we will um, learn, and we will grow because of it. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody said... And amen. Well, guys, um, after delivering the Hebrews from Egyptian bondage and that evil tyrant Pharaoh, God led his people to this place called the Promised Land. Everybody say it out loud, the what? The Promised Land. And the reason they called it the Promised Land is because God had promised Abraham that the, a, a particular that land, uh, he said, I'm going to give it to you and your descendants. And it's the land flowing with milk and honey. Not literally milk. There was plenty of honey, but, you know, obviously it's it's just a prosperous land. It was a fruitful, productive, and and blessed by God land. And so um, after God had delivered them out of Egypt, he, he wanted to, he led them to this place called the promised land. And God led them there because he wants his children to inherit all that he has promised. Everybody say, how much? All. He wants, to, he wants to give them all that he's promised. He wants them to live, I like to say it this way, he wants them to live in the zone. Everybody said in the what? Don't you like it when you're in the zone? You know, when, man, when you're, when you're doing good, when you are, you're reading your Bible uh, often, you're praying often, there's that connection, your church, um, you know, attendance has been awesome. You, you, just, you just sent, God wants you to live in his perfect will in the zone. Amen? And so um, God led them because he wants, he led them to this land. He wanted to give them the, the fullness of what he had for them and what he had promised them. Um, but when they got to the borders of the promised land, the land was inhabited by what real estate agents called squatters. Everybody said out loud, what? Squatters. Yeah. Squatters are people who unlawfully occupy abandoned or vacant spaces. Well, and these freeloaders that were squatting on the promised land were heathen idol worshipers with wicked, immoral lifestyles. They were depraved. Everybody said out loud, what? Depraved. Yes, God had given this land to Abraham and his descendants, but then they were back in Egypt for 400 years. And it didn't belong to them, but these squatters came and started, you know, just dwelling there homesteading the place, building their place. And these people had hearts darker than Dracula, if you know what I mean. These were some pretty evil people. Well, the squatters lived without conscience. They, they practiced idolatry and homosexuality and abortion. They offered their infants in sacrifice to an idol by the name of Molech and Baal. Now, Molech was a god who um, had an open fire, an open uh, oven in his stomach where they put the wood, and it had brass arms in which they would heat it up and they would turn glowing red with the heat, and then they would sacrifice their baby. These are the kind of people, the squatters that were living uh, in in the land of promise. And guys, one of the biggest groups of squatters that were there homesteading the promised land, what they did is they built and surround, they built a big city and surrounded it by two impenetrable walls and called it Jericho. Everybody say it out loud. What? Jericho. And I'm going to just point it out a little bit. Um, Obviously, the promised land is the existing land around this. There's one particular city of these squatters who they've decided to homestead here, and they are there to stay. They are like a tick dug in, you know what I'm saying? And they have built this city with two impenetrable walls. And um, and so they're there to stay. Um, Here's a situation, though. 
Joshua, as they're on the other side of the Jordan, they're looking at the promised land. They also see the city of Jericho deep into um, the territory. And so Joshua sends two spies into Jericho. They're secret agents. Everybody said out loud. They're what? Secret. Yeah. These spies were s- seemingly sent in to spy out the land, to do some reconnaissance to take the temperature of the city, you know, both their military readiness to to assess their their, their resistance. Um, So Joshua, you know, on the other side, they said, this is the land that God has promised us. This is, we spent 40 years getting here. We're finally here, and look at this. It's beautiful, but I'm going to send in, there's some squatters in there, so we're going to send in a couple of guys as a reconnaissance team to find out just exactly what we're up against. Now, at first you might wonder why they send in a couple of spies. After all, the last reconnaissance mission turned out to be a failure, if you remember. Do you remember that? If you remember, Moses sent in 12 men, and 10 of them returned, you know, the first time this happened, full of fear and influenced the majority that they're, you know, they're no longer, there's no way we are not able to conquer this land because there are giants in the land. So it makes you wonder why Joshua would, you know, at God's instruction, would send in a couple of spies if it didn't work Well, the first time, because that first time they came back and turned everybody against them, and they ended up walking a very long walk of 40 years. So why would they send them in? Everybody say, why the spies? Why the spies? Well, as the story begins to unfold, God's reasons for the spies becomes clear. So let's go ahead and read the story. Chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Let's read. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, set out two men from the Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took these two men and hid them. And so she said to the king's men, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where where the men went, I don't know. Pursue them quickly, for uh, you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued, the king's men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the, those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So, Joshua sends in two spies. They're going to re- do some reconnaissance in the land, find out what's there. The spies go to a place in Jericho where it's easy to become anonymous. Their first stop is a cat house on the west side of Jericho. It's easy. Nobody's going nobody's to be, you know, nobody is giving eye contact there. Nobody is assessing people there. They're just going to go into this cat house, and, and that's, you know, it's easy to get lost. And from there, they'll be able to kind of assess things. So they go to the west side, literally, and, and there's Madame, Madame Rahab. She's the gal, gal who ran a saloon and a brothel in the city. So that's where they went. All right? The, the, the flashing neon sign out in front of her place probably read something like Rahab's Place or the Jericho Club or La Cantina Liquor and Ladies. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's what it said. I mean, the, 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 this, this place sounds like a Brooks and Dunn song. You know, out on the country past the city limit signs, there's a honky tonk by the county line. You know, right? I mean, so, so, so that's, that's where these guys go. But there was more than boot scoop boogieing going on here. I mean, this was no place for a couple of Hebrews. I mean, these guys probably stuck out like a couple of Mormon missionary boys at a burlesque show, you know what I mean? And no wonder the king's men spotted them so quickly. 
I mean, they go to a place where they're going to be anonymous, you know, and they think nobody's going to recognize us here. We can just kind of in and just kind of do our, do our thing and do some reconnaissance. But, man, they just probably looked, they looked like they were in the wrong place and they were the wrong people. <laughs> yeah, he stood out, that's for sure. So the king ended up sending a team of government agents to Rahab's place. The, these agents, they, 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 they wore dark suits, rode up on black donkeys, I'm sure, and they go over to Rahab's, and, and quickly Rahab hid the spies on the roof where she would dry flax. Now, flax, guys, is a slender plant that grows about three feet tall, and when dried, it's, it's got a rough thread, kind of like yarn. It, it's a lot like twine after it's dried. Uh, the twine is usually is weaved into fabrics, brushed to soften it, and used for clothing or blankets or towels or sometimes even paper. Well, Rahab told the spies to go hide under the bushels, underneath the drying flax, while, you know, when she saw the government guys drive up. Well, the government agents are from the CIA. They are. They're from the Canaan, Canaan Intelligent Agency, right? And so here's what they do. They interrogate Rahab. And then Rahab, when they come in, they say, hey, listen, um, we understand there was a couple of guys that came in here the other day or came in, you know, earlier today, and we want to find out, you know, where they, where they are. Rahab lied and misdirected the authorities. Now, why would Rahab, an idol-worshipping barroom red-light madame, cover for the spies? Why would she cover for enemies that were planning on besieging their city? Everybody say, wow. You want to know why? We still have plenty of time. <laughs> See, God had been dealing with Rahab churning in her mind and in her conscience. In fact, the psalmist describes it like this. In Psalm 42, 7, it says, Deep calls unto deep. The waves of conviction are crashing all around me. Have you ever felt that? When God is just trying to get your attention, and he is, I mean, man, thoughts are just running in your heart and in your mind. And you're like, why haven't I given, why haven't I, why am I not doing what I should be doing? Why am I still hanging on to those the, 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 this pathetic things in my life? Well, that's, that's why Rahab, you know, decides to go ahead and hide these spies because there's something going on on the inside. There's a churning in her mind and her conscience. The, the constant news stories about these Hebrews and their God were, were beating again and again on the minds of not just her, but all the people in Jericho. It was like a tide of an ocean. That's kind of like what conviction is like sometimes, right? It just hits you and hits you and it hits you and it hits you. And look at your neighbor and say, it hits you, right? I mean, all they could think of in Rahab, I mean, she was feeling all this, the, the, this conviction and, and this Thoughts about God, a God who opened the Red Sea for these people and drowned their pursuing Egyptian army. How God had provided for these people in the wilderness, in the desert, for 40 years. How, how their God had given them victory over 11-foot giant kings and armies and how God had thwarted powerful sorcerers uh, just for them and brought them all the way to this place. Now, while the rest of the patrons in, you know, Rahab's bar and brothel complained and trash-talked about the Hebrews that were on the other side of the Jordan River, guys, you know they knew they were there. Two and a half million people have just come down. They're on the other side of the river, and everywhere they've gone, anybody who has given them any opposition has been leveled. And the stories that they're told, God sustained all of these people. How can, I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be an awesome God that can sustain two and a half million people through the desert from Egypt all the way to here. Think about it. There's no water in the desert. How do you get water for two and a half million people? Water that came out of a rock. They heard the stories, and in 
Rahab's conscience, this kept coming up about a God who could do those mighty things, about a God who would take care of his people the way that he did, about a God who sustained them. It, 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 it was awesome. Guys, Rahab, at, in fact, in that moment, changed her faith. She believed in the God of the Hebrews. Let's go ahead and cheer for her. Cheer for her. Rahab believed in the God of the Hebrews. I can only hope that the miracles that in our lives move unbelievers to faith in Christ. Now, Rahab's lifestyle was still askew, obviously, but she had moved from a believer in idols to a believer in God, or Yahweh, as it's stated. In fact, let's listen to her profession. Verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, these two spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. I know that the Lord has given... There's, there are people, they're still on the other side. But I know that the Lord, and she uses the word Lord, has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all of the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. And neither did we remain, did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God. Do you hear this woman? The Lord your God. Because the Lord. She keeps using God's tetragrammaton, his name. Because the Lord, he is the God of heaven above all the earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all they have and deliver us, uh, deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, our lives for yours. If none, of, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us this land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So, the king's men came over into Rahab's place and interrogated her. She sent him on a wild goose chase because she had the guys up on the roof of her house where the flax was drying, hiding. So she goes up at, there afterwards, and, and guys, she begins to declare this faith in God. She, she, she's, she runs a brothel. She, you know, she, she, she's a, a, a madame. And yet, she has come to faith in Jesus Christ. And it just goes to show you that God penetrates the hardest of places and the hardest of hearts. He is working behind enemy lines. Listen, God was working in her conscience in the brothel. God is working in, in all of those dark areas. He does. He works behind enemy lines like crashing waves beating on people's conscience. Or as John says in Revelation, he is knocking on the door of their hearts consistently and constantly. And somebody say, thank God for that, right? He calls to them in their depravity and in their deceit. I mean, pulling at their heartstrings. How many of you remember that when you were that one person in the dark and you were the person who was opposed to God or you were just lost and God started speaking to you right here, heart to heart, spirit to spirit, calling you to himself, the waves crashing, huh. right? And when one person like Rahab believes and confesses him, he will make sure to show them the way to salvation. Guys, this was the real reason for the spy's mission. This was the reason that they were even sent in. They thought they were on a reconnaissance mission, but they were there to save Rahab. Do you guys get that? See, the God of heaven knows our minds and our hearts. And even though she was where she was, her conscience changed. 
And she began to believe in the God. That's why she's calling him the Lord, the Lord God of all heaven and all earth, the God who created everything, the, God, the Lord your God. Wow. Something happened on the inside of her. Even though she's still doing what she's doing, but God wants to make sure that she's going to know the way of salvation. That was the reason those two spies went in. Guys, they thought they were there, like I said, on a reconnaissance mission. But listen, sometimes God sends us on missions that we think are all about us, but it's really for someone else. We call them God's divine appointments. So remember this. It's not always about you. Look at your neighbor and say this out loud. It's not always about you. We should realize that where life find us, finds us is not always about us. Sometimes we end up in this place where it's not a crazy coincidence, it's not karma, it's not fate, or it's not luck. Sometimes God orders our steps for others. Everybody said out loud, for what? For others. So stop complaining about where you work and the neighborhood you live in and the people that are in your group. God knows those who have believed but don't know how to be saved. And God often puts us in their path so that they can know and be saved. Right? Right? If you remember in the New Testament, there was a story where God pulled a guy by the name of Philip out of a city-wide revival to help an Ethiopian get saved. The Lord will sometimes put, sometimes puts us in people's path. Some are people we haven't seen for years. Sometimes they're people we don't even know. Some we do, but we've not even considered that they'd ever become Christians. But God puts us in their path for a reason. Because he knows what he's going to do. He knows what's on the inside. He knows what's the waves that are crashing on their minds and their hearts. And he puts us there so we can show them the way of salvation. So before we complain about sometimes the places that we're in, remember that God is the one who orders our steps. God puts people in our path at Walmart, at Lowe's, at the doctor's office, you know, uh, at the birthday party. God puts us, you know, in, in, in people's path at the MVD, at the restaurant. God puts us in the path of people living under or, or behind walls. Walls of depression, walls of hurt, walls of grief, walls of addiction, walls of dysfunction. So share the word of encouragement. Share it. Look at your neighbor and say, share it. Pass a track or an invite card that are out at the table. Invite them to a service or a, a small group. Lead them to salvation. God will use you the same way he used these two spies to reach Rahab. Always consider that. Look at verse 15. Watch what happens. Then she let them down by a rope through the window of her house that was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall and said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of sacred, of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father and your mother and your brothers and all of your father and household to our home, uh, into your home. So it shall be that whoever goes outside of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and, will be, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head and in the hand, uh, on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from our oath, which we, you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound a scarlet cord in the window. 
And they departed and went to the mountain and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers sought them all along the way but did not find them. So the two men returned, descended, uh, descended from the mountain and crossed over. And they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands. For indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. So here's this Rahab gal in whom God has sent two spies because her heart was changed and she needed to know the way of salvation. And so the spies shared with Rahab the prescription for salvation, a scarlet cord in the windowsill. It sounds a whole lot like blood on the doorposts that they, they went through in Egypt. Every male child was supposed to die, but those with the blood on the doorpost were spared. The death angel would pass over. Here in Jericho, God's judgment, it was going to pass over the house with a scarlet on the windowsill. When everybody else would die, Rahab would live as long as she had that scarlet cord up coming out of her window. And anybody in her house would be saved. Because Rahab adopted a belief in God, God gave her more than salvation. Everybody said more than what? See, as the story progresses, and I'm kind of just fast-forwarding it, we're going to go back and watch blow-by-blow blow detail, but this story of this woman, Rahab, you know, she, we know who she is. We know what her background is. We know what, what she was lost and depraved, but contemplating all that she had heard and about God. It was, it was convicting her into the point that she converted. She, she began to believe in the God of the Hebrews. And she, she turned down her, 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 her faith in idols and turned to the faith in the living, true God. And, and guys, here's what God did. God made sure that she knew exactly because he was going to preserve those who are his, because that's what he does. Even though destruction was going to come on the whole city, and, 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 and they knew that. She knew that. But she surrendered to God, and she tells these guys, guys, what can I do to be saved? Is there, is there some way? Tell me what I can do. Now, because I've shown you this mercy, please show me mercy. Because she adopted that faith in God, God did more than just save her. He changed her story because when the Israelites do come around the city of um, Jericho and, you know, the walls fall and everybody dies, she gets saved. Her and her household are saved. But God did more than save her. He changed her story. He gave her a future and a hope. And God transformed a bar club madame into a matriarch, matriarch of salvation. You see, once Jericho fell and Rahab was saved, a Hebrew man fell in love with a Rahab. His name was Salman. Salman. Salman Orbinson, I call him. He sang to Rahab, Pretty woman, walking down the street, pretty woman, kind I'd like to meet, yeah. My wife says women love to be serenaded. And I guess so because Rahab married Solomon and ended up as King David's great-grandmother. What? The one time, once upon a time harlot in the family tree of King David and even greater King Jesus in his family tree? And say, Orale. yeah. Here it is in black and white. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Here's the genealogy of Jesus. And here's what it says, starting with verse 2. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. And Judah begat Perez, and Zerah, and Tamar, and Perez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nahasson, and Nahasson begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab. There she is.
They didn't leave her name out. Even though her background. And Boaz begat Obed by Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and on down the line all the way to Jesus. You know, if Rahab would have had one of those cardboard testimonies, you know, one side would have said, gypsies, tramps, and thieves. But the other side would have said, mother of the great king in the family of God. That's God's scandalous grace. Say it out loud. What is it? God's what? God saves and forgives and adopts and heals and transforms. God writes a new chapter. He changes our story. He revises the ending. God wants to write a new chapter in your life. Will you let him? And if you do, then will you be a billboard that tells the story of God's scandalous grace? I mean, none of us deserved God's salvation. None of us could have ever earned his salvation. We were all depraved. And somebody said, oh, I, was, I was not that bad. <laughs> Through God's eyes, you were children that deserved his wrath. Because we were sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. And we're sinners by practice. None of us were perfect. We needed God's grace. We all have some colored past. But here's the awesome thing about God is that once we put our faith and trust in Him and our belief in Him, thank God He, he sends the Holy Spirit and He crashes those waves in our mind and our heart. Thank God that we, 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 we turned to Him and we surrendered to Him because then what He does is he saves us, but it's more than salvation. He adopts us into his family. He fills us with his spirit. He shepherds our soul as long as, we'll, as long as we will live for him. Isn't that awesome, guys? And he changes whatever your story was. I mean, because only you know where you were headed. He changes the story. He changes the ending. And now he calls you blessed. Here's the last verse for the evening. Here it is, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. And here's what it says. But God, everybody said out loud what? But God. but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So think about it. But God it says we were children of wrath, the first couple of verses. We were children of wrath, we were deserving of his judgment. But God, in his great love for us, sent his son Jesus to save us. All for a reason. So he might do a wonderful work in your life. So that in the ages to come, he might show you. He might show you off as the symbol of his love and kindness. See, you know what's going to happen in heaven? God's going to say, look, he's going to announce your name. People are going to say, oh, wow. And people are going to, people, we're going to praise the Lord because, you know, some people knew you. But all of us will have experienced the same grace, the same mercy, the same love. So, you know how, like, you play sports and you get a trophy sometimes, and it's just like you put it up on a pedestal, like, I'm that good. 
you are going to be God's trophy that shows his mercy and his grace and his love. And how, I mean, you who didn't deserve it, as I say, look who's here. Look! In the ages to come. It's going to be good to be there with you guys. God is changing stories. Let's um, go ahead and uh, just close in prayer. Father, thank you for this uh, time that we got to spend in your word. We're so thankful for your scandalous mercy and grace and love, Lord, that you have extended to each one of us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're, we're glad to be recipients of that. Thank you for working in us and doing your work in us. And thank you for not just saving us, but Lord, making us trophies of your amazing grace. I pray, Father, that our testimony in the arenas in which we live would just really, really shine all about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. I want to say so long to our Facebook family. We'll go ahead and um, light up the campfires now. We'll spend just 10, 15 minutes